So I'm what you call an animal behaviorist. And in my profession, people study how and why animals behave the way that they do. And it turns out that the study of animal behavior has been at the heart of many important human discoveries. For example, going back to the early pioneers of aviation, all the way back to da Vinci, they've studied flight in birds and bats in order to solve the problem of human-powered flight. The US Navy has funded research on echolocation in dolphins and bats in the development of sonar that can solve the problem of detecting things that we can't actually see. Research on things like insects and crabs has helped us build robots that solve the problem of autonomously walking around on distant planets without falling over. Now what these examples illustrate is that we humans often seek biological inspiration for how to solve difficult problems by looking to the solutions that have evolved in other organisms. And so what I want to do today is tell you about some of the work we're doing that looks to animals to try to find solutions to the problem illustrated in this photograph. Okay. This is Oktoberfest in Munich, Germany. And as you might imagine, this is a very noisy, loud acoustic environment, okay? And we've all found ourselves in situations like this, for example, during the break today, where we really struggle to hear what somebody is saying when there's a lot of crowd noise generated by a lot of people talking at the same time. Okay? Well, in the scientific literature, this problem is known as the cocktail party problem. And it's an important problem for two reasons. First, it's a very difficult problem to solve for people who use hearing aids or have cochlear implants, because these devices just generally don't perform very well in crowded situations. Second, Computer algorithms for automated speech recognition, which have applications ranging from online banking to flying military aircraft, just don't perform very well when multiple people are speaking simultaneously. Okay? So there are health problems and there are technology problems currently looking for solutions. Now, enter the animal behaviorist. It turns out that the cocktail party problem is not at all a uniquely human problem. Lots of other animals encounter and solve the problem of communicating in a crowd. And so here's the question that motivates me. What can we learn about how evolution solves a cocktail party problem by studying it in other animals? And in my lab, we study this problem in frogs, and there are a couple of good reasons to do so. One of these is that frogs are really loud, and they communicate in large crowds. So this is Cope's gray tree frog. It's the main species we study in my lab. It's very abundant here in Minnesota. And males of this species produce a very loud mating call that they use to attract a, a mate. Okay? The call looks and sounds something like this. Now, when I say that that call is loud, I mean it's like, like really loud, okay? On a decibel scale, it's somewhere between the most obnoxious alarm clock you've ever heard and a jackhammer, okay? So it's loud. Of course, the big problem is that these males call in very large choruses, okay? Comprising hundreds of individuals. And so in order to reproduce, a female actually has to listen for a male's call in very intense chorus noise, which is the frog equivalent of crowd noise, okay? Now, as you might imagine, this is a problem for the females because the female has to choose her mate based solely on what he sounds like. Okay? So the first reason to study the cocktail party problem in frogs is that they have a pretty serious one to contend with. Now, the second reason has to do with the evolutionary biology of hearing. Okay? It turns out that it's inappropriate to think of frog ears as simply primitive mammalian ears. Okay? Frog ears are what we in the business like to call frog ears. Now, let me explain what I mean. The most recent common ancestor that we terrestrial vertebrates, meaning amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, share with most modern fish, lived about 400 million years ago. And it already had an ear that had evolved for hearing underwater. Now, this is important because it means that some of the basic mechanisms for solving cocktail party-like problems might have actually arisen very early in the evolution of the vertebrate auditory system 
And as a result, they might be shared by all of the vertebrates shown here because we all inherited them from a common fish ancestor in the past. Okay? Now, fast forward in time about 300 million years, or to about 300 million years ago. And this is when the major groups of terrestrial vertebrates, then sort of amphibians, reptiles, mammals, diverged from each other. And we've been evolving independently ever since. But some of the major hardware we actually use for hearing sounds in air, and I'm talking about eardrums connected to middle ear bones here, those actually evolved independently in each of the major groups of vertebrates after this major divergence event. Okay, now this illustrates the point that evolution can create novelty in, in independent groups of vertebrates as they evolve. Okay? So this evolutionary history has important implications for how we study hearing and sound communication. Right? Because it means that some of the mechanisms for solving cocktail party problems might be shared, because we inherited them from an old ancestor. Others might be more recently derived in different groups of vertebrates, and hence be different in different animals. So the second reason we study the cocktail party problem in frogs is not because they're just like us, but in fact because they're potentially different in some interesting ways. Okay. So in my lab, we're interested in discovering how the frog's auditory system solves the frog's cocktail party problem. And this work involves a lot of sound recording and analyses so that we can characterize the acoustic environment in which these frogs communicate. We spend a lot of time collecting breeding females, which we can bring back to the lab and test in very rigorous experiments, which we conduct in what amount to little sound recording studios that we have in the lab. And if we play a sound to a female frog that she can hear, and that sounds like the call of a potential mate, she'll actually respond to it by hopping to the speaker. Now, I'll show you a short video clip of one such experiment, and watch what happens when the female, who's sitting at the center of a circular arena, we're looking down on the arena here, Watch what happens when she hears a call coming from the speaker in the upper left part of the screen. So that's a pretty typical response. And by manipulating the types of signals and the types of noise that we use in our experiments, we can ask a lot of questions about cocktail party problems and their solutions in these animals. Okay? Now, one of the main problems that a female encounters when listening for a male's call in high levels of chorus noise is that it's just plain harder to hear a male calling. Under completely quiet conditions, females could potentially hear males calling from very far away. And if we make some simplifying assumptions about how sound propagates in the environment, we can roughly estimate that females should be able to hear a male well enough to respond at a distance of about 225 meters. Now, that's almost two and a half football fields. That's pretty far to hop for a two-inch long frog. But if we add realistic levels of chorus noise to this environment, suddenly, females can only hear males calling from much, much closer distances. Okay? Now, based on what we know of the biology of these animals, Females don't really hop around the pond sampling different groups of males. So what this means is that anywhere she's sitting, she can probably only hear a handful of males whose calls rise above the background noise levels. Okay? So this is important because it means that the noise in a chorus constrains the spatial scale or the spatial extent over which a female could potentially assess and compare different mates in a chorus. Now, a second problem that these poor frogs face is that the females actually run the risk of having sex with males of the wrong species. Okay, now that's about as big a biological no-no as you can imagine. <laughs> but it turns out that there are two species of gray tree frogs in North America. There's Cope's gray tree frog, which is the species we study, and there's the eastern gray tree frog. Now these two species are very closely related, and across most of their geographic range, it's impossible to tell the two species apart just by looking at them. In fact, they're what we call a cryptic species. They, the males of, the bo of both species often breed in the same ponds at the same time. And as you might imagine, this poses a problem for females. Because if she chooses a male of the wrong species, her offspring are either sterile or dead. So it's an imperative that females get this decision right. And the only basis they have to make this decision are some subtle differences in what the two species sound like. Have a listen.
Now, if we give females that exact choice in the lab, either under quiet conditions or even under moderately high levels of chorus noise, they always get it right. 100% of the females we test choose males with the calls of her own species. But if we push them really hard, we make them choose in very high levels of chorus noise, something different happens. Females essentially start guessing. Right? They can't discriminate between the two species anymore. So this is a big problem for females, right? Mating with the wrong species. Now, I'm sort of detecting a, a, an underwhelming sense of horror. Uh, <laughs> so, so let me put this in perspective for you. There are maybe 300 people in this auditorium. What if I had just told you that we run the risk of having sex with the wrong species. Now, what I haven't told you is that in nature, these, there's actually a 5% chance that females really do make this mistake. Right? So, in this auditorium, that would be, what, 15 people that might have had sex with our closest living relative, the chimpanzee? <laughs> now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Don't worry. <laughs> but this should give you a sense of the magnitude of the problem. Now, just because females can get the males of the right species most of the time, that doesn't actually mean they've made the best possible mate choice decision. And this is because in great tree frogs, it actually turns out size matters. And of course, I'm talking about the length of the calls they produce. And so some males, call them machos, produce relatively longer calls compared to other males, call them wimps, which produce much shorter calls. Now, we know that machos are genetically better males, they sire better offspring, and so females benefit by choosing the longer calls of macho males. And if we give them this choice in quiet, they exhibit a very strong preference for choosing longer calls of macho males over the wimpy short calls. But if we give them the same test in noise, this preference goes away in some conditions. And the females essentially end up guessing between the two different types of calls. So this is important because it means that noise constrains a female's ability to make the absolute best mate choices possible. Now, these little tree frogs experience several potential problems by communicating in a crowd. And we're very interested in how the frog's auditory system might be able to um, sort of adapt to or, or uh, cope with these sorts of problems in noise. And as a starting point in our investigation, we've drawn very heavily on previous studies of humans, which have shown that we're actually able to exploit a small number of features of the acoustic environment in order to solve cocktail party-like problems. And so we've been asking whether or not frogs and their auditory system might be able to exploit some of the same cues. Now, one of the main cues we exploit in, a, in talking in a noisy crowd is spatial separation between the person we're trying to listen to and dominant sources of background noise. Okay? It's just generally easier to hear what someone is saying when the crowd noise comes from a different direction. And so we've been asking whether frogs might also be able to exploit spatial separation between calls and chorus noise. And so we've done experiments like this, where we present the call and the chorus noise together from the same speaker and compare their responses to conditions in which we present the calls and the noise separated from different speakers. And of course, our prediction is that if they can exploit spatial separation, then the audible distance over which they should be able to respond to males should increase. And that's exactly what we find. So in some of the spatially separated conditions we've tested, this audible distance actually increases by about 50%. Now, we've also shown that these females are better able to, to choose the calls of males of their own species by exploiting spatial separation. And so this is pretty good in, an indication that spatial separation is, a, is an important cue for these frogs listening in a chorus environment. Now, another cue that we humans exploit in a crowd is that the noise of the crowd actually fluctuates quite a lot from moment to moment. And our auditory systems are able to catch brief acoustic glimpses of speech during moments when the background noise momentarily dips to a quieter level. Okay, now, you're all familiar with an extreme example of this, right? You've been at a party when suddenly and inexplicably the background noise level just goes quiet, right? And there's that one person saying something really obnoxious or embarrassing at exactly that moment, and everybody hears it. Well, that's an example, an extreme example, of what psychologists refer to, refer to as listening in the dips. And so we've been interested in asking whether these frogs might also listen in the dips. And so we've done things like give them calls presented in chorus noise that lacks dips and compare their responses to noise that has the dips. Again, the prediction being that the audible distance should increase. Females should be able to hear males from further away when there's dips in the noise. And in fact, that's exactly what we find. Right? In some cases, the audible distance increases by over 50%. 
So this is a good indication that these frogs can exploit dips in noise just like they can exploit spatial separation between calls and noise. Now finally, we humans are very good at exploiting perceived differences in pitch when two voices overlap each other, okay? So, for example, we're much better at following a conversation with a woman who's speaking at the same time as a man compared to when two men are speaking at the same time, okay? And this is just because, on average, women and men have different voice pitches. So we've asked whether frogs might also be able to exploit differences in pitch between calls that overlap in a chorus, and we've done things like present them with a call that we then overlap with what I'm calling here a distractor that has, sounds like a frog that has the same voice pitch. I've indicated that here as the same keyboard key on the, on the piano. Now, we've compared these sorts of conditions to those in which we've separated the call and the distractor in pitch along a musical frequency scale. And our prediction is simply that females should respond better when there's a greater difference in pitch. And that's exactly what we find. For example, compared to the, difference, or to the condition where there's no difference in pitch, shown there on the left, Females can respond up to five times faster if the pitch difference between the calls is about an octave, or about 12 half steps. So this is a good indication that these frogs are able to exploit differences in pitch between overlapping calls in a chorus, just like we are. So let's take a step back and ask, where are we along this journey of trying to discover how gray tree frogs solve their cocktail party-like problem? Well, we've begun to characterize some of the problems that these frogs encounter in biological terms relevant to the frogs themselves. And we've now shown that humans and frogs can exploit some of the same features of the acoustic environment in solving this sort of problem. Now, this is very exciting for us. And the reason goes back to the evolutionary biology of hearing. Right? I told you that frog ears are not simply mammalian ears. They're frog ears. And that means that some of the solutions that frogs and humans are using to exploit these various acoustic features of the environment might be shared ones that we inherited from an ancient fish ancestor. But other solutions that frogs are using might have been derived in the groups and the lineage leading to frogs and might be different from how mammals solve these sorts of problems. And this is an empirical question we're very interested in pursuing in my lab. And so we're now doing work that will allow us to sort of probe these mechanisms by, by which the frogs are able to exploit various features of, of the environment using uh, a couple of techniques that are new to our lab. One of these is shining lasers, low laser light beams directly on the frog's eardrum or other parts of its body so that we can try to understand the biomechanics of how the sound actually gets into the frog's auditory system. And we're also using neural recordings to try to understand how the frog's brain actually computes what it needs to compute in order to exploit these various cues. Now, I started this talk describing how we humans often seek biological inspiration for solving difficult problems by looking to the solutions that have evolved in other animals. And if we want to understand all the ways that evolution might solve a cocktail party problem, so that we might someday use that knowledge to improve things like hearing prosthetics or software for speech recognition, then we have to put these sorts of questions to the animals themselves. And this is what we're going to be doing in the coming years in my lab as we continue to study hearing and sound communication in frogs. Thank you very much.